Hello, welcome everyone. We're excited to have you all attending today. I'm Jim Olson, the Assistant Executive Director for the National Tile Contractors Association. I hope all of you and your families are healthy and safe. Today's webinar is titled Large and Heavy Tile Mortars and ANSI Mortar Designations. This session will provide a manufacturer's perspective on tile industry standards development and the new mortar classifications. What's wrong with medium bed? Where did the large and heavy tile mortar come from? We will discuss ISO designations and the ANSI mortar designations for non-sag, fast set, extended open time, and the large and heavy tile mortar, and how it can benefit the design professional and the tile contractor in the field. Now, it qualifies for one LUHSW credit with AIA and IDCEC, and I will give the email address and information that you can request your CEU on the chat screen, so look for that shortly. Our sponsor for this presentation is Mapay. Please look for their advertisement in Tile Letter Magazine and multiple NTCA digital platforms. Before we continue, I do have a little business to take care of. Today's webinar will be muted. Please use the questions area on your computer to type in your questions. We will answer your questions at the end of this presentation. All of our webinars are available to watch at any time on the NTCA YouTube channel shortly after the webinars are presented. In somewhere between uh, 36 and 48 hours, we'll have those up and ready for you to look at. Please go to the NTCA YouTube channel, subscribe, and you'll be notified of all upcoming NTCA videos, including all technical webinars, giving you easier access to watch all current and past programs at your convenience. We will no longer have them archived on the NTCA website. If the audio on your computer is poor, call the number on your invite to this webinar to listen on your phone. All right, here we go. Today's speaker, Jim Whitfield, FCSI, CCPR, LEEDAP, is the Director of Technical Services at MAPE. He manages a strong technical services department that provides support for MAPE's many products for tile and stone insulation systems, floor covering insulation systems, and products for wood flooring. He is actively involved in the development of tile industry standards on TCNA, ANSI, and ISO committees. Jim is an NTCA ambassador and a proud member of the NTCA technical committee. He's the current president of the MMSA, which is Material Methods and Standards Association. In addition, the Construction Specification Institute honored Jim with fellowship in 2001. Welcome, Jim. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jim. Welcome. I appreciate you attending this program. I think you've got some new things to present that should be of interest of you to you. Let's talk about large and heavy tile mortars and ANSI mortar designations. As Jim mentioned, um, this program is available for AIA continuing education credit, as well as IDCEC. All right, <clears throat> learning objectives. This session will prov provide a manufacturer's perspective on standards development and new mortar classifications. Why the hype with 118.15 mortar? And where can that be used? We'll discuss ISO designations, as Jim mentioned, uh, the T designation, the F designation, E, and of course the new H designation for large and heavy tile mortar, what was formerly known as medium bed mortar. And how can these designations improve your project specifications or tile systems on your project? I want to start off with ISO. And because the mortar designations uh, really kind of start off in ISO and, and ANSI adopted them recently because it made sense. So ISO is an independent, non-governmental, international organization of national standards, similar to ANSI, but international. It has over 164 nations involved. It's got designate, uh, design delegates from 50 different countries. Um, they meet multiple times throughout the year. We have meetings, uh, they're all over the country, uh, all over the world. 
Um, we had one last year at coverings. So there's meetings that occur all the time. We have a call coming up in a week or two as well. So the, it's constantly changing. Why does it matter? ISO created this way of identifying mortars through use of designations. And I think that's an important part for you to understand. So simple ISO designations for mortar is C for cementitious. And then you've got C1 for normal cement mortars. C2 for improved cement mortars. On the right, you see designations F for fast setting, T for slip resistance or non sag, E for extended open time. And the next four are currently not ANSI designations, um, they are only in ISO at this time. So you've got S1 for deformable or flexible, S2 for highly deformable, P1 for plywood adhesion, P2 for improved plywood adhesion. Dispersion is identified through a D, again, D1 for mastics normal, D2 for mastics improved. The characteristics for mastics is A for accelerated drying, P for slip resistance or non-sag, and E for extended open time. Reaction resins are epoxies and urethanes. So you've got an R1 for normal, R2 for improved, and the T designation for slip resistance. Grouts work in a similar way. You've got CG for cement grouts. CG1 is a normal cementitious grout. CG2 is an improved cement grout with designations for F for fast setting, a for high abrasion resistance, and W for reduced water absorption. RG for reaction resin grouts like epoxies. They're higher performance characteristics than most than improved cementitious grouts. Again, why mortar designations? Well, one thing, if you're trying to compare products, it really, really makes it a lot easier. Um, you can bid equivalents by just checking out uh, whether it's a C2, F, T, E, uh, and, and, and really, really get down to the actual use of the material and how it can be beneficial. You can really do a good job of comparing them much, much easier than in the past. Be confident that the specifications or the product that you're using is really, really tailored or, or geared towards the installation that specific, you're specifically trying to do. And you'd be a lot more confident in, in offering a warranty because you know that the system's all compatible. To the architect, mortar designations give them the ability to specify products that meet proper performance characteristics for that project. If I had a large format tile, but for that matter, if I had a gauge porcelain tile going in a large atrium of a hotel. Picking a C2 TE S1 mortar would make a lot of sense. So I would want an improved cementitious mortar that has good sag resistance and extended open time, right? Because I'm trawling out the wall. I'm also trawling, trawling out mortar on the tile. I need longer open time than a typical installation. It gives the architect a lot more flexibility in controlling the cost because again, it's very project specific and able to generate generic reference specifications. In other words, just calling it out by ISO designations or ANSI designations with mortar uh, 118.4 uh, F for a fast setting latex modified mortar. For the owner, it gets them, gives them a little bit of uh, assurance that they're getting exactly what they paid for, that the components are really geared to work together for this specific project. To re really receive an installation will perform as he fully expects, and very good chance he can secure a better warranty. Again, some of the mortar designations for ISO. Just keep in mind C for cementitious, D for dispersion or mastics, and R for reactive like epoxies and urethanes. So in ANSI, we've got what is now 
four different types of mortars. Uh, back in 2012, we added 118.15, and I will talk about the 118.15 improved modified dry set cement mortar. The reason why I like to bring that one up is a couple things. One, it's an incredible improvement for our industry, and two, that's the year that we also did mortar designations or started with them. I know everybody's been seeing them for a long time, right? No, not really. When we first started to add mortar designations, I don't think you know marketing was able to keep up with it. You don't repackage, you don't change everything out right away. But I think a lot of the manufacturers now can show you how they meet the ANSI mortar designations. <clears throat> Those in blue, of course, are just the mortar ones. The others are other uh, ANSI material st standards. 118.1, dry set mortar. 118.4, modified dry set mortar. You must pass all the results for testing for 118.4 in order to get 118.11 for exterior glue plywood, and there's additional testing in that standard. And 118.15 for improved modified dry set cement mortar. So the mortar test methods, 118.1, 118.4, 118.15, added mortar designations. E for extended open time. F for faster setting, T for non-sag. So you might get an ANSI standard that looks like A118.4 TE. So you've got a non-sag mortar with extended open time, like I mentioned earlier, which in my opinion is ideal for gauge porcelain tile. The new designation added last year is H for large and heavy tile mortar, or what was formerly known as medium bed mortar. And again, that is also added to 118.1, 118.4, and 118.15. Let me sidetrack a little bit and talk about 118.15 before I get to the designations. So 118.15 is a higher performance mortar. Um, really, I think as we get into the differences, I think you'll appreciate it quite a bit. 118.4, Uh, is really the standard for performance modified mortars or basic mortar mod, performance modified mortars. 118.15 establishes, establishes a higher performance mortar than 118.4. Higher shear and bond strengths are required and new heat aging shear bond tests. And that's important. I'll come back to that in a minute. So 118.4, you know, when that product first came out, um, most of the mortars that were polymer modified were pretty high end. And as it stayed out there, you could get substantial differences between the minimum standard type 118.4 mortar and the high performance mortars that were out there as well. And that's really what drove this designation for 118.15 is to show that these mortars are quite significantly different than 118.4. Let's talk about the heat aging because I think this is important. You take a two by two porcelain tile, bond it together with an eighth of an inch of mortar and offset at one eighth of an inch. All shear tests are te set up this way. The specimens are cured for 14 days at 70 degrees Fahrenheit to 77. Then followed by 14 days at 158 degrees Fahrenheit. After those 28 days of cure, the shear bond strength must be higher than 400 PSI. That's a pretty substantial shear bond. So the interesting thing about heat aging test is you can't just increase the quality of a mortar by adding more cement to it. That alone will not make it perform well in this much variable of thermal expansion, contraction, and change. It requires a high polymer, polymer content as well in order to just pass the test. So with 118.15 now, where would you consider using it? Well, coming from Colorado and being born in Chicago, first thing that comes to mind to me is freeze thaw. Colorado, you could have a deck like you see pictured here, four inches of snow. The next day, it's 58, 60, 70 degrees, and it's melting quickly and just saturating the tile system. 
that night it drops below zero again or below 32 degrees and freezes again. So having that ability to handle that freeze thaw is really an advantage. Where flexibility is desired, where you really want some improved bond strength, improved shear strength, and improved thermal resistance as well. And heat resistance is important. I'm going to show you what the standard kind of looks like. Um, what you see here is 118.15 in the right column. All these yellow tests are all new tests. So that's why the heat aging one you see here is 28-day heat aging and shear bond test. Not available for 118.1 or 118.4. It is available for uh, the 118.15. And I apologize, it's 450 PSI. But you can also see there's a lot of other strength differences. 118.1 for seven day shear bond, tile to tile, 150 PSI. 118.4, 200 PSI. And 118.15, 50% higher, 300 PSI. The 28 day test is similar as well. 150 PSI for 118.1. 118.4 reaches 200 PSI. And 118.15, 400 PSI, twice as strong. So I think you really recognize some differences here and some of the benefits of the high impo the uh, improved modified mortar. Again, some different places where you might use it. Let's talk about LHT, or again, what was formerly known as medium bed mortars. Why the name change? What was wrong with medium bed mortars? Everybody knew what it was. Some of the ANSI committee felt very strongly that contractors and architects were abusing the term. They would say, sure, the substrate's not exactly perfect, but just install it with the medium bed method or you know, use your thin set to true it up. Not a good idea. So it was a term created by the industry, but really had no true definition. So that's what kind of drove to making a, an ANSI standard for it. Again, medium bed method was frequently used for prep on irregular substrates, or for that matter, where a mortar bed was supposed to go and they didn't have enough depth. So, and I commonly get calls that I've got a three quarter inch recess and they want a mortar bed and I have to stay level with the, with the concrete outside of it. How do I mix your mud to do that? And you don't, that's just not a, a, a appropriate use of the material. Um, that's a self leveler type project where you bring it up and then set to it. It was heavily misused the term medium bed and many felt it was best to just remove it from the tile industry and hopefully in time it'll go away and people will quit referring to everything as formerly medium bed mortar. So what's the benefit of a standard and a designation for LHT medium bed? Again, definition by performance characteristics. In other words, it's set up to actually, the testing establishes that this material will work with large and heavy tile. Um, there's non-slump characteristics required. Uh, tile is installed with a heavy tile on the top and after 28 days measured for lippage to make sure that the material itself, the mortar didn't slump. We're looking for less shrinkage at thicker depths. So this material can be used as thin as 330 seconds after beat in, as thick as a half inch. Many manufacturers may say you can go thicker than that because that's what we used to do with this, the, the previous the standard. Really provides better bedding for large tiles that have some warpage. So you take a quarter by three eighths trowel, you put down a regular thin set, you take a 12 by 24 tile that has some warpage in it, and you set it into that, move it back and forth, the odds are fairly good that the center of that tile is not supported by mortar. It's not even touching it. We need coverage for those mortars to work, period. All these characteristics, characteristics can really help in providing a flatter floor 
with less potential for lippage. And again, this testing that's done for the H designation is very different than anything done with any of the other standard mortars. In order for ANSI to include a new product, they have to establish why it's different than the other products that are already out there. And again, heavy tile, um, large installation, thick bedding, and after cure, making sure it hasn't created shrinkage or lippage is one of the ways that that test is done. What other characteristics would you like in an LHT mortar? How about non-sag? Certainly. So these are thixotropic mortars, giving them the T designation commonly. Thixotropic is where you put down a good bedding of mortar. It holds its ridges. You set a large format tile into it, move it back and forth, and the material becomes more fluid and increases the coverage underneath that tile. So one easy way to explain that is a ketchup bottle. You know, open up a ketchup bottle and tip it upside down. The odds are fairly good. You're not going to get much out of it. But if you shake that bottle or create shear, it becomes more fluid and will pour out. And that's exactly what happens to these mortars with, th with thixotropic characteristics. So according to the 2020 TCNA handbook, LHT mortar is a thin bonding mortar for ceramic tile and stone formulated by the manufacturer to minimize slump, facilitate a thicker bond coat as compared to the bonding mortar that's not labeled as dry set mortar for large and heavy tile or LHT mortar. This definition was not changed in 2020, even though we did get the mortar designation H uh, in 2019. It just it wasn't done quick enough. Um, it just missed it. That's all. So right now it still says it's intended for to be used as a bond coat 330 seconds to a half inch thick. LHT is declared as such by its manufacturers based on its characteristics. There are no ANSI or ISO standards specific to this mortar. Again, that's wrong. Um, at the time of printing, that was correct. But since we've got the H designation now that's passed and is in the ANSI handbook, uh, it, it is no it, it, the ANSI standard does have it does have an ANSI standard, and the new designation being H. So what is large and heavy tile? According to the TCNA handbook, characteristics of LHT make it useful for setting heavy tiles, five pounds or heavier, and tiles with ungauged thickness. So um, you might think of ungauged slate. It's not uncommon in an 18 by 18 inch piece of ungauged slate to have one end of the ungauged slate at three eighths of an inch and the other end could be three quarters of an inch. So not only do you need a good setting bed of an eighth of an inch or better, but you need to make up that three eighths of an inch for the irregularity of that stone. That's where a good half inch bedding really comes in handy. It can also be used for setting large tiles. When setting large tiles, larger tiles are needed. You need to make sure you have enough mortar underneath it, again, to, to, to hit all parts of the tile. Thicker bond coats help eliminate the issues that we see with warpage, hollow sounds, um, lack of coverage. Again, refer to ANSI 137.1 for allowable warpage for ceramic tile. So this is an important note in the TCNA handbook that should stay. Um, and it says LHT is not intended for chewing or leveling of substrates or the work of others. Where substrate variation exceeds allowances, in the case of greater than 15 inch tile on one edge, that would be one eighth of an inch and 10 feet, LHT mortar cannot be used to remedy such because the application would exceed the limitations of the mortar. LHT mortar is intended to be used to install tile per ANSI 108.5, the installation standard for installing tile by thin bed method. Really what this is getting at is in the past, tile setters very seldom did a lot of prep. 
they might have done some preparation with their with their um, mortar or a little bit of patch on the floor. But today, when you're dealing with ceramic tile that can be as large as four foot by four foot or gauge porcelain tile that can be five foot by 10 foot, you've got to have a good substrate. So in order to have a good substrate, it commonly takes surface prep. Self-levelers on floors, rendering or patching type materials for walls are essential. And one thing you'll see, I, I've seen, a, a, we came out with a product that was really a, a ideal float, if you might, or, or patch for walls uh, a couple of years ago that's fast setting. And we're starting to see a few other manufacturers do it because really not, most people didn't really think about having to float out walls. But I'll tell you what, with drywall and cement board, the way it's being installed today, um, and studs with crowns and so on, you definitely have to float out some walls to get a good looking wall if you're going to be doing GPT or a good large format tile. Again, and continuing with that note to the specifier, it says LHT mortar is a product, not an installation method. Project plans or specifications that call for or refer to tile setting by a medium bed method or large and heavy method or call for bonding mortars to level or fill substrates or take care of irregularities do not conform to the industry standards or norms. So really, really giving some good direction to the specifiers and trying to get away from that patching and, and, and repairing uh, with mortars because that's not really what they're intended for. And I'll be honest with you, probably more important, tile installers need to get paid for their prep work. It takes a lot of prep work to install these large format tiles. And if you don't, you're gonna have lippage issues, you're gonna have sharp edges, just not good. Other places where you might use large and heavy tile mortar, as I mentioned, uh, gauge stone, ungauged stone, like slate, um, saltillo, uh, that's not a stone, but, um, you know, accommodate different, different thicknesses. Uh, this is a box screen method. It's ideal for a box screen method. Let me back up for a minute. I'll explain a little bit more on the box screen method. Um, you know, box screen used to be very, very popular years ago with mosaics as an example, or again, it could be an ungauged slate. You would lay the finished side down on a, on a mortar table with a hole cut in the middle of it. Take two by two lumber, cut it down to the thickest tile on the board, plus at least an eighth of an inch. Dump the mortar on there, screed it off, and everything that comes out of that mortar table should be the same thickness. Can be really a benefit to ungauged slate or some really regular tiles. Or for that matter, um, unfortunately, we've seen a trend with um, different tiles from different manufacturers being used in a pattern. And they're not always the same thickness either. So box screening can help with that. It's not ideal. It's time consuming. Um, but it does get it flat if you do it properly. Large format tiles, like you see on the wall here, the store in Las Vegas. Um, Large tiles of all sizes, warp tiles, ones that have potentially could have lippage if you don't get a good bedding underneath it. The ability to adjust for small imperfections in tile or stone, especially tiles like Saltilla, Talavera, um, ones with more irregular backings. Again, I, I keep going back to slate, but it's a common one. So a lot of people don't do substrate preparation, not big on it, and feel that they can correct their imperfections with thin set. The substrate tolerances are more stringent for large format tiles, again, those with 15 inches or longer, one edge. An eighth of an inch and 10 feet, as opposed to a quarter inch and 10 feet for tiles smaller than 15 inches on one edge. No more than 1 16th of an inch and two feet when measured with a straight edge. Screwing with just thin set or mortar can lead to shrinkage issues or loss of bond. I don't think you can see it all that well in this bottom picture on the right, but this is a project I was on in Atlanta. 
I had to go down and take a look at this project um, because they were complaining. This project was installed in a condo, 20th floor of a luxury condo, and it had a sound reduction membrane underneath it. It was a rubber membrane that had a fabric uh, entwined into it really, where you could really grab the fabric. But <clears throat> on top of that, they took a basic thin set mortar and because of the irregularities in the stone and the substrate, I would say the first ones we pulled were an inch and a half to two inches thick of just thin set mortar. So the reason I got called to the complaint is because, let's see if I can grab this pen here. See how wide this grout, grout joint is now? Um, did I get it? Yeah, okay. So you see how wide this grout joint is here? It was all that tight when they left the job. Super, super tight. But because the mortar shrank on top of a fabric, on top of a membrane, so there was no nothing really restraining the mortar, um, as opposed to if it was set in concrete, on concrete, it would at least had some uh, surface tension. Uh, it just allowed the material to shrink. And honestly, they had a nice tight setting stone job. They came back later and this is what it looked like. This is from a job I was on. Now, I'll tell you a little story about this project as well. <clears throat> the tile contractor um, came in and he's a fairly good sized guy. Turns out, former linebacker for the Atlanta Falcons, now in the tile business. So, you wonder what those guys do when they get out of it? Well, I can't tell you they all go into tile, but at least this gentleman did. <clears throat> I took a look at this floor and I knew what they'd done. And I told the gentleman, let's go down to your truck and, 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 and grab a tool. He said, no, 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 that's okay. Whatever you want to do, you know, we can talk in front of everybody. I said, no, 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 I, you really do need some tools to, so you know, we can take this out and, and take a look at what's going on here. I, I can't, I don't have x-ray vision. We need to get at least a couple tiles out. And the owner, the GC, flipped out. They said, we want to know answers. We want to know why it's doing this. We want to know now. And I said, please have some patience. We've got to get some tools to really help out here. Um, and again, you know, you can see they weren't happy with the way their floor was now that it dried. It's even dropping here. <clears throat> we went down to the truck. I told the gentleman, I said, look, that mortar is extremely thick, way beyond what's required or allowed for that type of mortar. And it was a standard mortar. It really shouldn't have been built up any thicker than a quarter of an inch. It exceeded it by six to eight times. I told him you're responsible for this and we're gonna go back up there. I can tell them what went wrong, but I prefer you to do it. And we went back up there, everybody's standing around, not too happy with us because we left. And he did have a pry bar and a hammer and so on, and <clears throat> took out the tiles and saw that the mortar was extremely thick. And looked at me and he looked at them and he said, look, this is way thicker than what this mortar will allow. Um, this is my error. This gentleman, Jim, he said he'd help me with the materials to get it right. And we'll redo these areas that, that the joints are really opened up like this. So, you know, it's one of those stories where you go on a complaint you're concerned and it all turns out really, really very, very good. But again, it had to be redone. See the lippage there, you can see lippage here. So you can see how inconsistently it dried, how wide that joint is, how tight those joints are. Not good. When surface preparation is needed, the tile setter should be paid for it. It needs to be done. It's not just something that can be done with mortar. It has to be done correctly. What do you not want to do with LHT mortar? Well, spot bonding. Again, this is typically a, a poor um, prep situation where preparation has not been done correctly. So they dab some mortar on top of the, uh, or, or notch out the wall um, and dab mortar on the back of the tile and then push it in there lightly, just trying to get edges to meet edges of tiles around it. This allows the mortar to get built up way too thick, 
it lacks coverage, it will fail. It has impact issues, it has moisture issues. So if it's exterior, water will get in there and start collecting and show up through the back. Um, it's a bad, bad situation. And unfortunately, we're seeing it commonly today because people don't know how to prep a wall properly or prep a floor. It will fail. The odds are extremely high it'll fail if you do it this way. Pay attention to the amount of water that you're putting into an LHT mortar. Let it work the way it's supposed to work. Uh, a good mixture will minimize slumping for sure. And again, this is what you get when you get slumping. You end up getting edges out where one sinks. These sunk because it's probably a wetter mixture than these are right here. Not a good situation. Lippage there, lippage there. Again, we don't want to see that on our projects. So in summary, tile industry standards help establish an even playing field for all those involved. LHT is a product, not a method. LHT mortar is ideal when stacking the var variables. Separate state preparation, mortar shrinkage, mortar slump, tile warpage, tile and stone weight. Look for those H designations on the materials that you're using. Select the proper mortar for your project using ISO or ANSI mortar designations to really dial in the performance on your project. Large format tile with edges greater than one edge, greater than 15 inches, requires a substrate tolerance of 1 8th of an inch and 10, no more than 1 16th of an inch and two feet from the required plane, from the highest point in the floor. And one rule I always repeat no matter what, Always include movement joints in your design. Follow the TCNA method, EJ171, now 20. This was 19 when this program was written. Thank you. That went a lot quicker than I had anticipated. So, Jim, I'm sure you've, you've got some questions, or I'll be glad to address any questions that have been sent in. Jim, thank you, great job. I wanna just make sure everybody sees the email address. If you are requesting a CEU, um, please send them to Jim at his email address right there. I did also put that on the chat screen and um, it was a really good presentation. A lot of knowledge was thrown out there, a lot of information and uh, thank you. Yes, we do have uh, some questions, Jim, let me get to those. Um, the first one was simple and uh, it is, does the color um, of the tile mortar make any difference in performance? Hmm. It can. Um, oh, typically a white cement's a finer grind, so it sets off a little bit faster and it's typically a little bit stronger. Obviously white's recommended when you've got light colored grouts or translucent or you know thinner tiles, um, so it doesn't bleed up and then you have an issue with your grout. All right. Um, we have another question. What is the proper mortar for resin or mesh back mosaics and GPTP? Well, those are night and day. Those are two totally different things. So let me try to address that. Uh, let me address those separately. Um, so the right mortar for GPT is, I, I'd strongly suggest you contact your setting material manufacturer. Uh, we have a variety of ones that we recommend and we actually were the first in the industry to come out with a mortar specific to it, one that was very th thixotropic, has extremely good open time, very creamy, um, and, and, and that was our, our ultra, uh, Ultralight S2. Um, most manufacturers will have their go-to mortars and, and suggest, have different suggestions. I would say that we've probably got eight different types, uh, including a new one called Super, uh, Careflex Super, that would be ideal for GPT. And then of course there's fast setting ones too. Uh, we do have, have rapid setting ones that if you are, I, I realize that all gauge porcelain tile are not, every project's not five foot by 10. There can be as small as a half meter by half meter or one meter by one meter, even planks. If you wanna work with rapid mortars, there's no problem with that. And so uh, we have a variety of, of rapid setting ones as well. So there's not really, in the case of the backings and GPT, um, I only know of one manufacturer that puts epoxy in that backing, that fiberglass mesh. And in that case, we recommend typically epoxy uh, or a polyurethane adhesive. 
so most of the rest of them are, are just a polyurethane backing uh, in the fiberglass and very bondable by a, a premium latex modified mortar. Mosaics, that's a different animal. And, and we talk about mesh and mosaics. There's a variety of ways of setting mosaics, of course, and, and, and there's dot mosaics where they've, they've got a large plastic dot, if you might, holding the tiles together. There's mesh um, that typically, in years ago, we used to see it in paper. Now it's more of a fiberglass type material and, and, and fairly flexible. Um, I have seen some of those very, very heavily latexed to the point where mortar isn't even getting through, unfortunately. Uh, very little mortar is touching the tile. Most of it's just touching the mesh. Um, I recently saw it on a failure in uh, Hawaii, unfortunately, on an exterior. Um, there's also, what we prefer, of course, is um, clear or, or paper-mounted, face-mounted mosaics, um, where you're setting tile directly into the mortar and you know, remove the paper or clear film afterwards. And, and it really, with porcelain tiles, you'd certainly want to have a, a, a polymer-modified mortar. Um, premium ones can be essential if you're dealing with a lot of thermal changes and so on, like, for instance, in a, in a sauna or a uh, steam room or, for that matter, uh, a, a shower floor of somebody who really likes a hot, hot bath, you know, where you're really going from hot to cold and so on. So, um, I'd use a 118.15 mortar in, in those cases, but other than that, a typical 118.4 um, should perform fairly well for you. Good answer. Thank you. Um, is there a LHT installation method? No. There is no LHT method. Um, again, LHT is just an adhesive or a mortar to be used 330 seconds to a half inch in thickness after tile or stone's been beat in. It is not an installation method. I, I would have to tell you, I'm sure that's the answer they wanted to hear. So, <laughs> good job. <laughs> um, we do have someone asking if there's, a, is there a chart, a, like an industry chart of what mortars work for what situation from all manufacturers? And if not, is that something we should come up with? I don't know of one within the industry. I can tell you that MAPE has one in their um, tile and stone installation systems brochure right in the first four or five pages. Uh, and, and it really gets into a lot of specifics and as well think, as the standards that it meets and so on. So I don't know of one for the industry. It'd be quite an, a task. I'm not saying it's a yeah. bad task, but there's so many changes. It'd be really hard to maintain. I think your best recommendation on that, Jim, and maybe you can agree or disagree with me, would be, you know, do exactly that. Go to the manufacturer's specification, yeah. you know, and each one of them will have their specifications and their outlines of where to use them and how to use them. And that would be the best comparison. I strongly agree. I definitely agree with you. Great, great. Um, does the mill thickness of liquid membrane have anything to do with bond or shear strength of the thin set mortar to membranes? Ooh. I guess it could. It, it, it'd have to be pretty thin to affect it. Um, I, I, so the bond strength of thin set mortars to most membranes, the requirement's only 50 psi. Now, remember what I just told you, in the heat aging test for 118.15 is 450 PSI after it's gone through 158 degrees for 14 days and, and, and basically at room temperature for 14 days. So that's quite low, but they perform well. Um, I guess if you got it super, super thin, it's a, I, I, I don't do testing myself. I, my background's installation, but I would think maybe if you got it really super thin, it might affect it. But for the most part, no. All right. All right let Another me say something else, Jim. I'm sorry. Let me. Sure. But, no, go ahead. But mill thickness is essential. So, mill thickness is essential for the membrane to perform as it's intended. So, if you've got a requirement for um, 30 mils wet. You really should be checking that with a, a wet film gauge so that when it dries, it meets the requirement of, of what it's required dry, it might be uh, um, dried film thickness of, of 20 mils. So in order for it to perform as a waterproof membrane, it really should be close to the, the, the specified requirement for thickness. Absolutely no doubt about it. And that's true of crack isolation as well. 
Yeah, great. Fantastic. All right, here's another one. Can all LHT mortars be used in a normal thin set application? And if so, would it not be ideal just to have manufacturers make those and do without regular thin set so we can simplify the product options? The easiest way for me to explain this is a little bit of history on the LHT or, or what was then medium bed type mortars. We first started making mortars for thicker beddings. That was achieved through adding more sand. So if you think about a concrete slab or concrete itself, the changes in the aggregate allow us to go thicker. If I have a concrete slab that's six inches that you're standing on right now, I probably have three quarter inch pea gravel at a minimum, if not even larger aggregate in it. In non-sanded grout, I've got marble dust, very, very fine aggregate. So for years, the way we achieved medium bed was by adding more sand. That may not feel real great underneath a one by one or two by two mosaic. Today, most manufacturers are no longer doing their large and heavy tile mortars just through adding more sand. There's more body to them. There's more chemistry to them where we can actually, um, many of them will say that you can mix it as thin as 330 seconds, as thick as a half inch and, and, and allow for that. The industry standard allows for it to go as thin as 330 seconds, but it may not feel the best if it's an old fashioned, I, I hate to say that, but that's the best way for me to explain it. Um, sand type medium bed mortar. And I can't think of, we just don't have those in, in our line today, uh, like they had years ago. So um, our lines are, are, are substantially different and they can easily go 330 seconds or as thick as three quarters, I'm sorry, half inch. So I think there's enough differences within the industry that right now is not a time to, to really go and replace all those. I think in five, 10 years. I think that's very feasible that that as tiles remain large, I don't see them ever going back to being really small, um, or let me say eight by eight or six by six type floor tiles. Um, you know, I don't see, as long as it remains large, I think that that may be the case down the road is that they, that, that just makes more sense to carry that product than your standard thin set. And again, those are typically 330 seconds to one quarter inch in thickness after beat in. But don't you also think, Jim, that um, installing tile is is not easy? It's a it's a craft, and it, it becomes expensive. And if you can use a appropriate thin set or mortar that is a little less expensive, that that's a a good way to uh, keep costs down a little bit. Absolutely, and I think that's again one of the best reasons for these mortar designations. You know, so you know what you're getting with the product that you pick up. There's a substantial difference between you know one with extended open time and a standard mortar. So if you're working with a really large format and having to fuss on this project, you want extended open time. Um, I, it, you know, I think if you're putting quarry tile in a commercial kitchen on a concrete slab, um, those are absorptive type substrates, you know, and, and and tiles. You know, you should be able to get by with 118.4 mortar, assuming that you do everything else correct. Um, if you're going exterior in Jim's neighborhood up in Minnesota on the tile deck, I'd strongly recommend you consider 118.15 because you're going to go through some major temperature changes. So, yeah, absolutely. Great. All right. What about ex what about installing uh, tile in uh, exterior? Do you think uh, all of your recommendations uh, apply to exterior installation? I will just say if you've never done exteriors and, and you're about ready to venture into it, you really need to pay attention. You know, there's a few things that are essential to exteriors. Um, I'll say number one, selection of the right, right mortar. And, and, and you have to know your environment. If you're changing temperatures through the year up to, you know, 100 degrees from uh, throughout the year, then, then you need to have one that's going to allow for some movement, some uh, flexibility, if you might. You need to make sure that you've got good coverage. You know, coverage interior for our mortars to tile in the substrate is is 80%. Exterior, it's 95%. Why is that? Because that 5% void, we can handle that. But once you start getting into 20% void behind a tile, and again, it starts filling up with water in an area like Jim's or where I used to live in Colorado, that water is going to freeze and expand, just like your water bottle in your freezer, and blow that tile right off the wall. So. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I think exteriors, you know, in addition to that, movement joints are essential because you are going through those temperature changes. And, and I mean essential. If you're going to be waterproofing that deck as a secondary waterproofing, you need to get up behind the finishes. You know, just putting waterproofing to the door sill or on the face of brick is not adequate. Water can get down behind the brick through the mortar joint and get behind your waterproofing system. So you really have to pay attention to a lot of details once you get exterior. How are you tying into flashings? How are you tying into uh, window or door headings on, in, the, in the case of a facade? Um, exterior installations are very, very tricky. Not impossible to do, but very, very tricky. And if they're done correctly, can last a long, long lifetime. But unfortunately, we commonly see them not last well very long, and that's because Let's face it, I'm a manufacturer. They don't call me out to look at good jobs. We go out there and look at the failures. And almost always it's lack of coverage and, and bad waterproofing principles. Great. Can I just let everybody know that I accidentally deleted a couple questions. So if you sent them in in the last five minutes, please resend them. Um, we have a, a question here. Does L over 600 requirement for IBC 1405.10.2 for masonry veneers also apply to interior porcelain tile? I'm not familiar with that. I mean, I'm familiar with the porcelain standard and that's not part of it. I'm sorry, the porcelain part of that code. Um, I think L over 600 is quite extensive. The TCNA handbook says that we have to meet the requirements of, of IBC and IRC. So if that is the requirement for, that kind of surprises me for masonry, um, then yes, it should be met, straight up, no doubt about it. Uh, deflection is no longer listed in the TCNA handbook as L over 360 for tile and L over 720 for stone. Um, it, it literally calls out, follow the, the code book, as well as for live and dead loads. All right, great. Um, do we have, um, is there something for referencing uh, for inspectors? when they're on inspections? I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, so. Um. There, there's new guidelines, they're not, yeah, there's guidelines within the TCNA handbook now for inspecting projects, and off the top of my head, I'm gonna say it is uh, high level to a floor, and you know, I'm not really sure what the, what the specific requirements are now, but it is in the TCNA handbook in the um, sections up front, and just look up inspections, or, project right. recommendations. Correct, correct, great. All right, when using a rapid setting wall prep flattening product, is there a long wait or cure time before tile can be set? And wouldn't that be uh, specific to each manufacturer and what their recommendations are, Jim? Absolutely, follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Do stick close to the thicknesses recommended and if they have specific bonding requirements. In other words, sometimes you'll find that they have uh, um, requirements that you put a slurry coat on the wall first or it could be a bond coat of mortar before you put that material up on the wall. Um, make sure you follow those or even wet the substrate for that matter. Um, regarding visual inspection of, of tile work, the TCNA handbook says view the installation 36 inches from the wall and 60 inches or normal standing height for floors. Perfect. All right, here's one you and I were talking about before we started today. Will an LHT installation method be developed as a standard? I do not see that ever being developed as a standard. I don't see, even see a reason for it. Um, no, I don't believe so. I, All right. I, I think we're pretty opposed to that actually. Perfect. All right. So one of the comments is we have a proper calculator method, warpage versus tile manufacturers. I, I'm not sure I quite understand that. Do you understand it, Jim? No, there are warpage allowances in 137.1, um, depending, for instance, in a porcelain tile, whether it's calibrated or whether it's rectified, rectified being much tighter, and I'm assuming that right. might be what they're asking about. And then there is lippage requirements in the um, ANSI as well as TCNA handbook, again, in the front. And, and those lippage requirements are in, a, in addition to the allowable warpage of the tile. In other words, it may be a 16th of an inch for lippage in addition to what's allowed by that quality of tile. If you've got calibrated versus 
rectified, it's going to have more warpage possible. Correct. And they can find them in both those locations. Correct. All right. We have one more, Jim. How much loss of strength in thin set is a result of overwatering, wrong drill mixing speed, improper mixing paddle? Wrong, I mean, a high speed mixing and, and the wrong paddle can literally cut polymers and, and affect the bond some. The amount of mortar being added, because we're, we're making mortars today, let, let me just say it this way. I strongly recommend you stay within the manufacturer's water ratio. They're within their range. And, and, and there is a range, and it could vary anywhere as much as a quart, quart and a half. Why? Well, for instance, we have 11 different manufacturing facilities in North America. So, you know, is every single component in there the same? They are all the same, but the cements might vary a little bit and all that kind of thing. So you get a little bit of a range, but generally if you stay within that range, you are absolutely going to be fine. If you're, if you're putting uh, mortars on membranes and you're, you're anticipating troweling into uh, an uncoupling or for that matter, a waterproof membrane with fiberglass, something like that, you're typically going to be on the looser end. And in the case of large and heavy tile mortar, if you're looking for real non-sag characteristics, you're going to be on the higher end. Obviously, the more water you add, the more it's going to want to slump. So, you know, it kind of depends on your situation, but I would definitely say stay within the water ratio listed on the, on the bag and, and the manufacturer's directions. So let's just say this again. So overwatering, wrong uh, mixing speed, and improper, improper, uh, improper mixing paddle, yes, they can all have a, a make a difference in the strength of the thin set. And please Definitely. follow all manufacturer's recommendations for the amount of water, the speed you should mix it, the mixing paddle you use. It's all given to you from each manufacturer. All right, we do have one more. Does an ANSI A118.15 dry set mortar require back buttering? There's no mortar that requires back buttering. For tiles larger than, I'm sorry, um, when trying to achieve 95% coverage with any of the mortars, the ANSI standards say that you should back butter if you need 95% coverage or select the proper trowel to give you coverage. And the other thing too, the only times, I mean, in my opinion, that you really have to do back buttering is it's kind of more just uh, like an extruded tile where there's actually, if you might, dovetails in the bottom of it. You used to see quarry tile like this all the time years ago. Um, you want to fill that in ahead of time. That's the wise way to do it. If you've got irregularities in the tile, consider getting that nice and flat first before you have to deal with your substrate. So um, it kind of varies, but, you know, I, I, uh, back buttering is not required. I will just say that straight out. Just make sure you have enough mortar to make sure you got bedding of that tile and you got coverage. Correct. Yep. Great. All right. So before we get done here, I want everyone to know, please uh, register and attend our next webinar scheduled for July 9th. The invitations will come out soon. Jim, fantastic program. Attendees, thank you for being here. And those of you that have stayed till the end, um, I think you just... Uh, we're part of a, a great presentation with a lot of good, useful information. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. And that ends our uh, program for today. Thank you. Thank you.